two broad groups are those who are members of superannuation funds and really don't give it a moment's thought beyond you know when they get the annual statement or the six monthly statement in the post they have a look at it and they say yeah that looks fine then you've got another group who have got all of their other financial commitments out of the way and uh, approaching retirement and all of a sudden superannuation becomes this thing that's sort of hanging over their heads and they've got to put more in they've got to you know ramp it up so that they can afford to to retire in comfort the key challenge is is engagement that single word engagement how do you engage your membership so even though we've got all this default on membership default on investment options default on insurance option i mean these funds build these wonderful flexible arrangements that no one takes advantage of um, because they're not engaged in many senses i think we are the lucky country and of course because we're at a superannuation conference i'd have to say that the superannuation system we've got in australia makes us the lucky country uh, for a long time we wanted members to become engaged with their superannuation well as a result of the simply super in first of july 2007 boy are they engaged you know? uh, ask anybody running a call center or watch the paper flow going backwards and forwards to the superannuation funds members are now engaged for many people superannuation is simply a good uh, method of saving which is being done effectively by remote control by somebody else and many people despite all the talk about uh, choice and directing your investment many people are quite happy to sit back and let somebody else do that as long as they're prepared to take that that relatively passive approach towards their superannuation I think it'll work. Once they brought in that uh, the money put in and claim back on your tax order that's when we started which was only in the early 90s mid 90s sort of that we started so like we got nowhere near enough super to retire at the moment sort of as you said probably the farms are sort of a bit of a superannuation thing for us but for many it's just it's it's like that um, movie you know Sunday too far away it is it's just so far away they don't care I just love listening to Don Stammer who always says I would just want you to teach your children one thing the power of compound interest and after you've taught them that teach them the power of compound interest again my sort of generation um, I think you find those sorts of people understand just just what it can do for them in retirement if um, if you know they do the right sort of things with their super and, and what sort of a difference it can make to them and mm. exactly right it used to be a, a conversation stopper as soon as I told people that I worked in superannuation end of conversation let's yeah. move on to the next topic our generation seems to want everything now they um, you know they're not really looking forward to you know 40 years down the track when they they're gonna have to depend on this money increasingly I don't know whether it's uh, a sign of my age group but um, I go to dinner parties and people are talking more about superannuation than they were two or three years ago. Hopefully I can save a little bit of money here and there through my life before I retire, but j not just on the superannuation, no, it won't happen. I think people don't really know about it. One of the fascinating things that I've really learnt or that's been brought to my attention is that um, superannuation can be people's biggest investment in their life. Not all people, but some, but yet it could be the one that they've pay the littlest attention to or spend the littlest of time on it or just don't know. Superannuation is the, the brilliance of economic policy because it means that it gives um, you that support base in which in retirement you can choose to do whatever you want. I knew it was something that I couldn't touch till retirement so in the back of my mind don't need to worry about it. It's a means of um, securing your future, um, also taking a, a a bit of responsibility from the government as far as looking after um, people in their, their retirement ages. I think though you talk to most uh, people at super funds and the most common request they get through their call centre is still, how do I get it out? Mid 40-ish will say inadequate. Members under mid 40-ish say mythical and they all say it's too hard. For years we've been trying to get people to at least have an opinion about superannuation and this year not only do people know what we're talking about but from what we've just heard there's some room for optimism however we still have a long way to go. Getting the baby boomers to recognise the need to keep saving and investing is more of a challenge and there's more on that topic later in the conference program. Right now we have the opportunity to compare the thoughts on video with the results of our AIST research. Well, superannuation, many of us in this room think it's, think it's great. We think it's the best social policy developed over the past 20 years, a retirement policies revolution. 
But what about the rest of the population? What do they think? Last year, as AIST was developing its policy platform and position on adequacy and a number of other issues, we decided to take a step back from the industry view of superannuation and find out exactly what the rest of Australia thought. So we commissioned Ipsos to undertake an Australia-wide mind and mood study, and it's the first ever done on the question of superannuation. And the research is quite detailed, so we won't be getting through all of the material today, but what we will do is focus on the mood of the nation when it comes to super. And at yesterday's afternoon session, Hugh Mackay talked about the re-engagement of the Australian society. And hopefully, I'm thinking, this might eventually translate into engagement in super, because we certainly need it. But I'll let Nicole um, talk to you and take you through all the details of the research project. Just by way of introduction, Nicole Talker is the Executive Director, Marketing Services for Ipsos Australia. Nicole is a specialist in consumer anthropology, consumer marketing, marketing research and business information. Nicole um, commenced her career specialising in qualitative research methods and applications development whilst earning a Masters in Statistics. And prior to joining Ipsos, Nicole served as the Australian Executive Director at Nielsen's. So please welcome Nicole. Morning. Thanks, Fiona. Just want to start by introducing what we did in this study and then getting into the detail about how Australians are thinking and feeling in relation to superannuation. We were privileged to pull up a chair in true Hugh McKay style and listen to 14 gatherings of friends, workmates and colleagues. Neighbours chat uninterruptedly about what was on their mind in relation to superannuation. What were their motivations, what were their aspirations and what were their concerns? We also held 18 in-depth interviews with Australians in more detail about their particular feelings around super. We then quantified these feelings in a survey of 2,000 people. All of the findings from this study are drawn from middle Australia, so upper middle to lower middle socioeconomic strata covering men and women aged from 18 to their mid-70s. All major capital cities were included, as were a variety of fund types, work sectors and personal circumstances. As the title of this presentation suggests, there are many myths. There are many misconceptions and there are some mistrusts relating to superannuation in the community. As I present these results, I won't be saying whether I think they're true, false or indifferent. I'm presenting what Australians are thinking and feeling. It is now time for you to sit and read a sprinkling of their comments as I present to you the mind and mood of the Australian population. So please listen and contemplate these opportunities and challenges that these findings represent for you. With the introduction of compulsory superannuation in the past 15 years, Australians now have the benefit of retirement savings and the majority of Australians actually view the concept of compulsory superannuation as sound and well-intentioned. And overwhelmingly, the majority that we surveyed were happy with the way their funds were performing. However, compared to the actual value of their home or their knowledge of what the value of residential property is, the amount in their fund was not to perceived to be actually so super. As one man commented, my house is worth 560 grand. I'm lucky to have 80K in my super fund. The dominant financial goal for many of those in this study was centred on housing. So either getting into the market, trying to pay their actual mortgage or purchasing an investment property. With strong returns on property across Australia in recent years, many considered bricks and mortar as a sound investment over many others. The majority actually believed that superannuation was a better investment than paying off their mortgage. When we surveyed this, it was at 14% of the population. For many under 40, really weighed down with the demands of mortgages and families, 
they often expressed a real sense of frustration that they're unable to access their super money now. Um, you saw in the video someone was commenting that a number of calls they get at the call centre is, how can I get my money? Much of this for the under 40s is really driven by a belief that their money is worth more to them now than what it would be at 65. When asked how confident are you that you will have enough superannuation to live on when you retire, 28% were very or fairly confident. 53%, so just over half, were not confident at all that they would have enough money to live on in retirement. And it's worrying. It's worrying middle Australia. Over half of those surveyed said they worry about not having enough money. So they recognise that the amount they have is not enough to live on. Many are extremely indignant that superannuation should not attract fees, particularly when there are minimal funds held in an account and when they take extended leave from work, particularly if it's for parenting or sick leave, they don't feel that fees should apply. Super is marketed as a key financial security, thereby instilling a strong perception that it should come with some sort of guarantee, a guarantee about returns across how their fund will perform. While many recognise that they've had good returns on their superannuation in recent years, a jungle of financial advice and advisors in the marketplace has given rise to widespread insecurity just over how safe is an individual superannuation now and importantly in the future. Compounded by continued commentary about the volato volatility of the global economy, witnessed daily on their nightly news. 30% reported they were worried that their fund could go broke and worried that they would lose their entire retirement nest egg. Australians reported feeling uncertain as to the government policy and the capability of any government of the day to actually change legislation to the detriment of their superannuation. This disquiet extends to an uncertainty of what governments might do at the time when they are actually retiring. The government will probably change the tax rules by the time I retire and I will lose a lot of my superannuation in tax. 48% agreed, 19% were unsure. There's also uncertainty around the lump sum rules applying when they actually retire. Only 12% of those surveyed were confident that the lump sum rules would actually apply when it was their turn to retire. For many, their attitudes and behaviours are underpinned with the recognition that they actually know little about what's involved in their own superannuation and feeling disengaged with it because they also have quite a lack of knowledge and they find it too complex. When asked how much do you feel you know about your superannuation, 79% reported knowing a little or not very much at all. In a world that is awash with information, respondents made it clear that only that which is relevant to them will be absorbed. Few, one in four surveyed, said they did understand the jargon of superannuation. Many did not understand it. This lack of understanding makes them often suspicious of superannuation funds because of the complexities of the information that they're receiving that constantly, always, to them, looks the same. One in five reported having no idea how much super they actually even had. Younger generations should be well on their way to a secure retirement given the compulsory deductions into super from their first pay packet. Despite this, we're now in a time of increased casualisation in the workforce. Many young people reported having multiple funds through casual employment but recognised whilst they should roll it over, it was either too hard or they felt the amounts were too insignificant to bother. While superannuation is not intended to be gender specific, many women continue to rely on their partner's earnings and decisions when it comes to their own retirement planning. Often this is driven by the transition to childbearing duties. 
reducing their household to a single income for an extended period of time. And the claim that there just won't be enough money to get by day to day, week to week, let alone trying to think of setting themselves up and saving for the future. Bubbling under this surface for many women is the recognition that should they separate or divorce, their financial position would be of real concern in the immediate and in the long term. But is it my money? People often remark, talking about the 9% contribution, in ways that showed complete disconnection with that money. One in four don't think of superannuation as being really their money anyway. As it's not discussed in the workplace generally except in the HR environment, so it wasn't a topic that was generally discussed amongst their friends or their neighbours, occasionally their work colleagues. In relation to how they are selecting funds, 66% of them just went with the employer one and 13% of them carried it over from the old. So in terms of who's actually searching out, deciding what is the best fund, and there's multiple definitions across consumers of what that might be, 7% of those surveyed actually went out and researched funds. Otherwise, they just went with the employer one. Ironically, well, it is very apparent that the findings from this study, many people shy away from dealing with their own superannuation or actually feeling involved in it. There was quite a few who commented about trying to chase super up or making sure that their superannuation had been paid. Particularly if they're denied what they feel is rightfully theirs, whilst they will chase it, albeit later rather than sooner. The ability for employees to avoid making the 9% compulsory contribution is very real for some employees. During the course of this study, participants often felt able to voice their questions and when particular members might have had some more knowledge than others due to either their education or their workplace experience, they were tagged as experts by their friends, neighbours or workmates. This, however, also exposed some of the misinformation and myths that sit around the benefits, choices and legislation pertaining to superannuation. Aware of their platform of opportunity among their peers, the unqualified among the participants suggested. I had my accountant out and he said to me, in the near future, it's all about to change. So use your super to buy an investment property. One of the other nominated group experts commented, the supposed industry experts reckon you are better off putting more into your mortgage now than into your super at the moment. The other one that was prevailing was, every dollar you put in, the government will match. In search of this trusted relationship, an individual financial decision making is not easy for many. A trusted relationship is sought and superannuation is no exception to this. No surprises in finding that the priorities of different age groups and generations were diametrically opposed. However, the passage of life and generational attitudes historically follow many patterns of similarities. With the common hurdles of possible illness, reaching middle age and getting financial affairs in order, easily ignored and overlooked until absolutely necessary. It appears that the portrayal of superannuation language and timing is often interpreted as unrealistic, particularly in time. God, that's so far away, I can't even imagine getting there. They talk about 20 years when their horizons are one, two and five years. Also, it is that there's very little that is communicated to them around people actually living a good life in retirement, so very few actual examples. Much of this language of the never-never really manifests itself in a continued unresponsive by individuals for retirement planning. It's just so far away, I'll think about it tomorrow. 
One of the primary financial responsibilities of an adult life is the need for allocation of money into insurances. Car, house, personal health. I'm sure everyone in this auditorium has multiple insurances. With the creation of family, life insurance and income protection insurance are often added to the list of necessaries. With superannuation, well, it aims to insure for one, for one, when you are not lo no longer working, it is not a term or a concept that many Australians are associated with. For many baby boomers, their memory of the term life insurance and not positive memories around insurance remains fresh, often sold to their parents as an assurance of money that would come of age when they turn 21 or the would pay for a parent's funeral rather than leaving them to bear the cost. In some ways, this has been quite a deterrent to the notion of insurance as something that will gain in value as an investment, with their experience showing that most of the years of contribution were absorbed by agent fees. Well, younger generations are clearly recognise that superannuation is a valid concept and construct. They see their window of opportunity, opportunity is panoramic as opposed to a porthole. Multiple jobs, travel, paying off their hex debt, a career that suits them, and getting into the housing market are their main concerns. For those in their late 20s through to 35 years, while well, financial demands are multiple and pressing, the need for distractions from that daily grind of life work, relationships and families, instrumental in their prioritisation for other pleasures. As one commented, I reckon when you are 55 you'll be thinking soup is a good idea, but at the moment... A lack of time and of disposable income is constantly cited as the reasons for not sorting and prioritising financial planning. Although this is often preceded with an acknowledgement, that's no excuse. The complexities, demands and aspirations of living, learning and work absorb everyday life, leaving little room for future planning of any sort and for many it's quite simply just not on the radar. But time catches up. When we surveyed Australians, just under half felt that they don't have enough time left now to build up enough in their super fund to actually retire on. Ill health is the time bomb few prepare for. And for those in the critical age group of 50 to 60, any disruption to a working pattern and the ability to allocate money to their superannuation fund and future planning takes on much bigger significance. But this isn't recognised until they're actually ill. With unprecedented levels, and I'm sure Hugh would have spoken about this yesterday, of household debt in Australia, fewer people live by the maximum save for a rainy day. Fuelled by the cost of living, the property market, increased consumerism and the availability of credit. Debt is just a part of contemporary life. One of the comments that was prevalent in the qualitative phase was, we're all just in the same boat. Australians are tending to find someone else to shame or blame when it comes to their financial decision making and their lot in life. Either baby boomers blaming the youth of today or vice versa or middle Australia blaming the wealthy. Of equal impact is the elusive monetary figure actually needed to retire and survive. Well, younger people are often singled out by older generations as actually not savers. There's a niggling resentment among those in their early 20s towards baby boomers, whom they see as irresponsible with their money given the length of time they've had to save and prepare for retirement. Echoing this thought is the observation in this study across generations that there really are few positive role models either presented in the media or in respondents' lives of people who genuinely have a good lifestyle in retirement due to superannuation. Much of the information that they see and record is what they 
think is far out of their reach. It's things you do when you win Tats Lotto, in a yacht, in a luxury house, etc. How much is enough? That magic number that no one can work out. <clears throat> Predictions and forecasts of what amount of money will be needed for retirement cause mass confusion. An alarm with individual lifestyles and values closely linked to this. Trying to understand and decide what is this magic number that we will need to live, to keep our current lifestyle or just to survive. What may seem like a little money to one person is the equivalent of a fortune to another. And I'll just cite you this one comment. I was having this conversation with this dude the other night and he earns 90 to 100 grand as a military police or something. And he said, you know, I worry about not having enough. He's in his 40s and he's got 750 grand. I said, are you serious? I can't imagine ever having that much. Fed by a regular disclosure in the media of a fictional monetary amount required to actually raise your children and this cost of bringing up children, parents rejoice in voicing just how expensive their kids are and that these days they just won't leave home. Yet underlying this kids are expensive comment really sits a justification for many as to their current levels of debt. Participants in this study prioritise their children with their mortgage as their principal financial priority, even if their children were of adult age. Parents admitted that they would do whatever it takes to get their children successfully into adulthood and that their retirement saving is a second goal. Many seeing investing in their children as also investing in their future. There is also some resentment around super, super legislation that was perceived to be benefiting members of society above the majority. Recent changes to before tax contributions in particular, allowing much more to be moved into super is seen as rewarding those who already have the money, the wealthy. It's only benefit, benefiting people that can afford to put a chunk of their income into super. You have to have a fairly high disposable income to do that. 